Okay, so we've had our first quiz, had our first assignment. Hopefully, you all did well. Uh, and we've finished our uh, short run analysis. So what we are going to do today is move on to medium run analysis. And remember, what was the major difference between short run and medium run analysis is that in the short run, we assumed that uh, the price level would not change. The price level was fixed, so much so that in the three chapters that we have done so far, we haven't even included price in any of our models. So we've looked at the goods model, we've looked at the financial, uh, the goods market, we've looked at the financial market, we've bought them together in the ISLM framework, but we haven't talked about price. So, and some of you may have, at certain points of our analysis, some of you may have realized that this analysis that we're doing is incomplete without including price. Uh, so that's what we are going to do today. We're starting uh, chapter, what is this? Chapter seven, I suppose, from the book, The Labor Market. What we are going to do in this chapter, obviously we're going to look at the labor market and uh, unemployment and trends in unemployment and all of that things. Uh, but also another thing we're going to do today is we're going to introduce price level into our model for the first time in this course. And we're not going to move it around today. We just include a price level in this chapter. And in the next chapter, we see what happens to the model that we develop in this chapter when the price level is going up or going down. Uh, it's, it's something called a Phillips curve and some of you may have already heard about it. It's basically the relationship between inflation and unemployment. And so, so let's get started. And of course, you've all done eco one or two already. So you all know what unemployment is and we've had a very generalized brief review of unemployment in our first lecture. So instead of talking about what unemployment is and all that, let me just give you guys an example. All right, and this is an example straight from the book. This is the case for United States. And it's, it's a bit dated. The figures are about four years old, I think. Uh, the edition of the book that we're following came out in 2016, which is the latest issue. So these are 2016 figures. So in the United States, they have a total population of 318.9 million. If you guys want to do, once I'm done working through this example, if some of you are interested, uh, you guys can go look at some data. These are quite easily available and try to develop a similar case for Bangladesh. And it will be quite interesting and it just helps you understand the scenario a little better. Okay, so we have total population now, when we want to look at the employment or unemployment or the labor market, obviously we all, we all know that not everyone should be counted as, you know, as part of the population who is eligible to be working. So for example, five-year-old children. If you're trying to calculate unemployment rate of a country and we include five-year-old children, I mean, that's not really a proper analysis, is it? That doesn't tell us anything. So from total population, what we want to calculate is something called non-institutional civilian population. Okay. So what does this mean? What this does is it takes a total population and from that it subtracts everyone who is less than 16 year old. So you're not working when you're younger than 16. So all those people are subtracted. Also people who are 
in the military are sub subtracted because you know if you're part of the military you're not part of the labor force that's quite obvious so those people are subtracted and we also subtract the institutionalized people so people who are in jail people who are in other sorts of clinical or mental institutions they're all subtracted and when we do that for USA we are left with uh, 247.9 million. This is how many non-institutional civilian population there is in the US. From here, I mean, this still isn't what we need. From here, I'm actually, this branches out into two directions. In one direction, we have the civilian labor force. In the other direction, we have people who are out of labor force. And in the US, the population is, this is 92 million. And this is, uh, how much is this 155.9 million okay so what are the distinctions between a civilian labor population and people who are out of the labor market okay so people who are civilian who are part of the civilian labor force are people who are either working already or people who are looking for jobs so people who are interested in getting a job and working people who are out of the labor force are people who are not interested in working so not only are you not working you're unemployed but you are also not willing to work so you're not part of the labor force and from here we finally get the employed and the uh, unemployed people so in USA back in 2016 or rather 2015 I suppose uh, there were 146.3 million people who were working and there were 9.5 million people who were not working and so finally if we want to calculate the Unemployment rate in the US, what we do is that 9.5 million people do not have jobs out of how many? Not out of 318.9 million, I mean, which might be the, the initial reaction, but out of the people who are actually interested in working, and that is this, this 155.9 million people are either working or want to work. So 9.5 divided by 155.9 million equals to however much you get. I don't have a calculator with me, so I don't know what you get. So you see, I mean, at first glance, it might seem like it's quite easy to calculate the unemployment rate of a country. I mean, it, when I was, before I had studied economics, I used to think it's literally the population in the denominator and people who are not working in the numerator. But if you try to do that for Bangladesh, you will see that our population is, I think, 50%, maybe more than that. Simply because, you know, we have so many people who are not only are they not working, but not interested in working either. So as I said, if some of you are interested, try to do this analysis for Bangladesh in 2020 or 2019. And if you do end up doing it, please let me know. I'm actually interested to find out how this plays out and what it looks like. Okay, so let me bring this down. Let's take a look at this. This is once again, directly from the book. I've just copy pasted it. So let's take a look at what this tells us. So we have, let's see. Uh, okay, so we have 139 million people who are in 
numbers aren't really important. So we have an employed population. We have an unemployed population and we have out of labor population. Okay. So basically we have the employed population, the unemployed population and the out of labor population. Okay. So let's take a look at what's happening here. Let's take a look in this relationship. So this, this is on this movement are based on monthly data of USA. I don't think we have enough data to construct this for Bangladesh. So, I mean, if you want to try, you can. And if you're successful, do let me know, but I don't think it's, we have enough data. So what we have here is that, look at this arrow right here, this arrow. So that is that every single month, 1.8 million people who are employed are becoming unemployed. And every single month, another 2 million people who were unemployed are finding employment. So that's, that's quite interesting because when you think about it, this is not happening over the course of a year or a longer period. Every single month, there's this movement, 1.8 million people used to have a job, no longer have a job, 2 million people used to not have a job, have a job. Uh, so basically the idea is that unemployment, even though the unemployment figure may not move around a lot, so suppose it's six, it may go up to 6.1 and 6.2 or go down to 5.7, but even though this figure is not fluctuating rapidly, going up or down, it is important for us to realize that for individual people, the em employment or unemployment situation moves quite rapidly. So you may get fired, you may decide that you don't like your job and leave, you may just want to take a break from job. So there is a large number of people who are leaving their job every month, but also a large number of people who are getting new employment every month. And because these two figures are so close to each other, the unemployment figure isn't moving. And it might give us the idea that this is a very stationary state. If you have a job you're going to hold a job for a really long time. If you are unemployed, you're probably lying unemployed for months and years at a go. That's really not the case. That might be the case for some people, maybe the case for a lot of people, but it, there's also a lot of people who are you know, moving between these areas. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, we have this relationship right here. This is employment to out of, the labor force. Okay, so this right here, you used to be employed, but now you're directly out of the labor force. What might this be? This can be people who are retiring. So you were working, but now you've decided to retire. So once you leave your job, not only are you not unemployed, you're not even looking for employment. And so you're out of the labor force. And similarly, this relationship right here, people who were not working until last month, but they found employment. Okay. But what is important is this relationship. So if some of, actually I've, I've, I've seen the class roster, so a lot of you have done Eco 102 with me. And so you should remember that I spent a lot of time, probably more time than any other Eco 102 instructor on the concept of discouraged workers. Simply because this is an important part of economic, macroeconomic analysis that's often ignored. So what is a discouraged worker? To understand that, you have to first understand what you need to do 
to be considered unemployed. So to be unemployed in US, you need to have applied for jobs in the last, if I'm not mistaken, six weeks. Or, I mean, there's a time period. Now, if you have not looked for jobs in, let's say, the last month, you are not unemployed. You're just automatically considered as out of the labor force. You're not interested in finding a job. Now, there are a few problems with this. First of all, you may be looking for a type of job that, you know, that there aren't many vacancies in that area. And so you haven't been able to apply. That is one issue. Or another problem that may occur is that suppose you have been applying for jobs. You have been trying to find employment for a few months, maybe for a year. And at some point, you get discouraged. You're just disappointed with the outcome of your job search and you stop applying. But what that means statistically is that you're now considered a discouraged worker and you're no longer unemployed. So the, what that happens then is let us come back here. You used to be unemployed, but because you're disappointed, you've stopped looking for a job, and so you're considered out of labor force. When that happens, in this figure, both the numerator is going to go down because the number of people who are unemployment isn't 9.5 anymore, and also, the employed, uh, the, the civilian population is going to go down. But since both this numerator and denominator are going down by the same amount, what's going to happen is that unemployment rate is going to fall. So when you're trying to analyze the situation of a country and you see that their unemployment rate is falling, at first glance, it may seem like this is a good thing. The economy is doing well, fewer people are unemployed, you know, and, and in most cases, that is true. But it may also be the case that you have not found a job for such a long time, or that your prospects of finding a job is so low that you've just given up You've given up hope and you've stopped looking for a job. That is not a good thing for the economy. You do not want the people to be suffering. However, statistically, unemployment rate is going to go down and it's going to look like the economy is doing great. So this is what I spend so much time. I'm not going to in Eco 207, but this is why I spend so much time in 102 behind discouraged workers is because it, it's happened in a lot of countries. In, in the, the, the best example would be US economy. Uh, let's say from around 2010 to 2016, statistically, employment rate was going down. Uh, unemployment rate was going down. And a lot of people were saying that it's a good thing, but it wasn't. Unemployment was going down because People were either leaving the job market or people were finding a lot of part-time jobs, not full-time jobs, which isn't very good either. If you're looking for a full-time job, but you can only find employment for 10 hours a week, that's not very good. You're not earning enough money. But statistically, once again, you're not unemployed anymore, you're employed. Okay. So that was our introduction to employment, unemployment,